All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another big week. I mean, it doesn't really get any bigger than this. It's third week options expiration. We know there's trillions at risk. We know that, of course, this week marks the biggest options expiration of the month. And it also marks that week that usually tends to act more around options. So in today's video, of course, today's live stream, we'll be talking about all of that. We've also got our giveaway. If you're interested in entering the giveaway, we will be doing the draw over the next 24 hours. Make sure you put it in. Link in the linked, I think, pin description right now in the comment section. So enter that. It's free to do so. And of course, that's just a giveaway to the community members to say a big thank you to everybody that follows, subscribes, and joins us here. We've got so many people joining us through this morning. We've got, of course, Dave, Bit Badger, Mike GFX, Indian Dude, Michigan Trails. So you quite a lot recently. David Shields, Ken. Matej, Byrne, Drayton, no problem, Oleg, and I'm not sure, or we've got Permit Fisher in the house as well, and so many others here, but uh, maybe we'll be graced with uh, with Ric Flair a little bit later on. We, we always like Ric Flair in the chat. So everyone, it's a, it's a market that's down today, but the general test has been what happened with that inflation number. We, since we did our last stream to the public community here together when we were talking about it, We've had big news. And of course, that big news is is inflation gone. Let's just go through some headlines here. I'm just going to read a couple of headlines. Uh, of course, we've got some discussions about uh, realistically China. I believe Biden and Z may be meeting for the first time in quite some time, uh, which is a big deal for, of course, the markets. Then we've got curbs to COVID zero policy starting to get cut got OPEC cuts oil demand outlook as it starts to curb production. Interesting. And then we have the inflation numbers. So we'll be talking about all of that today. We'll give you our opinions on inflation and whether we do think it's probably found its peak. <laughs> Is it the real Ric Flair? You'll have to ask Ric Flair that comes in the chat, but no, I don't think so, Chasmos. <laughs> I don't think he watches the stream, but it'd be pretty cool if he did, wouldn't it? All right, so let's talk about US 500. Let's get started with some of the lead indicators. Of course, we'll begin with inflation. Let's talk about the yields because we need to know whether we've seen peak inflation. I'm not sure if I have a chart here that will describe it. I'll just go through some of the ones that I have up here. Just wondering if I've got one that shows the kind of inflationing peak off. I don't think I do. Uh, but oh, I guess yeah, this this will do. This is this is good enough. So annualized inflation rate moderates. So this is of course from one of our previous videos. And the key here is that if we look at previous curves, very rarely does it turn and then go back up. We had a little turn here back in the '90s, then we saw a peak. But on these incredible inflations, the stats seem to be that we've seen the peak. We're clearly coming down. The real question now is: is it stag? That is, the the inflation stays for longer or is it just going to reduce and we get some type of soft landing? And the market's pricing in, of course, and starting to price in that soft landing. I want to ask the chat, though, what do you guys think? Do you think that we have seen, uh, are we going to have a soft landing or do you think it's going to be some type of stagflation, a little bit more persistent? There'll be, let's say, some questionable movements over the next 12 months. What do you guys think? Um, let's go through, yes, again, these these inflation curves. Let's have a look at the long-term interest rates and why it's changing and what we want to look for in the week ahead. So by April 2023, we expect the Federal Reserve to be at somewhere around 4.88%. Now, this is a very important because if we don't understand where these curves are, we really can't invest. It's going to be very difficult for us to be clear on what we're actually trying to invest. So 4.88, by September, we're at 4.85%. So the market's still basically saying we're going to need to leave rates at least approximately like six months. Inflation's going to come underneath. It's going to hit hopefully Fed targets, allowing for the Fed to curb. And this is going to hit companies around the world, regardless whether we want to believe it. I think we're going into a bit of a kangaroo market's time. December 2023, we find ourselves at 4.55. And by March of 2024, we find ourselves at about 4.2. So that's multiple rate cuts coming through the back end of 2023 into 2024. A lot of the chat believes that we've seen potentially the 
top of inflation, but it seems like a lot of you think that there's a sticky inflation. The Fed may slow or stop rate hikes, but not drop yet. Yeah, so the consistency is basically to the end of 2023, we stay fairly high. We then start cutting in increments to try to support the economy. How much damage gets done here? And are there cracks? Because remember, this FTX scandal, this FTT stuff that's going on in crypto and everything else, they all don't help with the financial stability. And right now, it's never been a question of whether the banks have really been coming under, except for some of the European ones. Here we have the XLF sector. Look where we find ourselves this week. And this is why I want to bring up this discussion point. We are at the tippity top. The financial sector hit a peak level. Now, as we know, for a market to truly be sick, usually you need to see finance not doing so well. Arguably, it's doing pretty damn well. In fact, it's basing in a, in a, in a fairly decent way. Is volume high? No. Uh, is volume consistently better than it was? Not really. But it certainly is at the peak. And I think this, this marks an interesting level of potential turns, even though the S&P 500 is not quite at the right zone. So XLF, something to watch here over the next couple of weeks. And that's something that, that I'm very, very, very interested in. So yields expected to stay high. My opinion still remains that we have some issues moving forward. Potentially, the market will want to dump again, which I think is really important because while that might not go down to the new lows, depends on the numbers, there's always a good case to be said that you shouldn't be following FOMO. And if you miss an opportunity, what's your plan? Is it that was, okay, this is the the test. You know, when, when inflation goes down again, you were just going to invest. If that's true, hey. That was your plan. As soon as you see inflation change, even if you're down, even if it goes up 4 or 5% straight away and you miss it, your plan was to invest. That was your catalyst. If you're a trader, you don't care. And I want to really, really reiterate this throughout today's session. If you are a trader, you do not care whether you've missed out on a 5% move. It may sound weird, but all you care about is risk to reward. You want high reward for low risk. If you make 5% in a 0.2% move, then that's totally fine. That's what you've done. You've replicated it. So just remember, traders don't care about the move. Investors certainly do. Because traders are more like more thinking about how much reward to risk. That's all that you really care about. Reward, risk, reward, risk, reward, risk, reward. An investor says, okay, well, I want to hold it for the long term. I want the best price. And then, of course, I want to play the statistics. People like dollar cost averaging for those reasons. So let's go through the VIX. The VIX has spiked a little bit here in today's session, 23.83. Is that something to be concerned about? Not really. Is it coming back down? Yes. Is that consistent with the only other time we can really find this in, which is 2008? Uh, yes, it is. So this is what happened in 2008. We went down to around 20, underneath 20. And then, of course, some cracks started showing Lehman, uh, Lehman et cetera. And it was, it was pretty bad. Trade vesting. That's right. Yeah, we talk about a lot. The trade vest randomness, that's where we buy a stock and we go, I, I know it's going up $5. I hope it's going up five bucks. Next day, down 10. Ah, that's all right. I always, oh, I was going to long hold this. It doesn't matter. That's, that's it's all good. It'll be, it'll be back. It'll be back by the dip. And then it just doesn't come back. And <laughs> Or if it does, it's the trade vesting. So we certainly don't really want to be doing that. Uh, the right part of all these charts are blank, Philip says. I'm not sure what you mean, Philip. It's definitely correct. So, yes, VIX, again, very consistent with that previous. We do, haven't seen a 45 plus. That was one of our base case theories. I'm not going to change it yet. Consistently throughout most pullbacks throughout time, any good ones anyway, you usually have a 45 plus VIX. That's been something I've I've looked for this year. I haven't seen it yet, which is strange to say the least all right let's look through some more positions let's have a look at the us dollar because that's been the story of 2022 this has been the strongest thing thank you very much pradeep c19 singapore five dollars appreciate it man appreciate the support as per usual and yeah this is this is the main discussion point dollar index is it at a point of some strength so first up i just want to go through a little bit of supply demand 
we've obviously had levels on the way down. We had this level first, we found some buyers, then we get the inflation number, it goes down, it hits this level. We expect an interaction. We, we expect it, okay? We, we hope there's an interaction, we expect it, and we're looking for a trade there. Now, the key to understanding trades, and this is something that you really always need to do, is you have to activate them. Just because it's come into a zone that you expect a val uh, some type of movement, you want to then have the patience to react off that level, to see the markets turned around. Now, some people will use lightning bolt theory. Some people will use something similar to my advanced scalping masterclass. And there are a whole bunch of different ways of activating trades. But when it comes down into these levels, you still have to have an activation method because even using higher time frame supply demands is not, it's going to find you the zones that you want to be focused on. It's going to be finding the zones that you want to target for your take profits and stop losses, but it will not necessarily activate high quality trades. And if you want to take it to the next level, you need to be able to activate in those zones correctly and logically. So where, where do we find ourselves? Well, we find ourselves in a little bit of structure before an explosive move. We also have, of course, an alert that I have set here. My other one went off, which is sitting. So if I was shorting, let's say up here or something, I'd take some profit off in this zone. I take some profit off in this zone. And I'd probably consider taking a little bit off in this zone if that was my plan. So at the moment, we're seeing if, is there any turnaround story? Is there a turnaround story starting here for the DXY? Now, if the dollar goes up, what's going to happen? The stock market generally will go down. So that's what we're looking for here on the charts. Let's check it out. Let's go and have a look. Do we have enough structure at this area? Well, we're starting to put pressure on this high end. See this 107,145? As we scroll down through the timeframes, we go to the 15 minute, we can see here that we're starting to put structure on that level. And we know that's now a critical zone to watch for the day, this 107, let's go 15 area. So I'll set a little alert there just because I would like to know if that happens. Now, if that happens, I would probably expect the stock market to be dropping at the same time. We'll synergize those together later on in today's stream. Pradeep, I believe, did another, another super chat, $5 Singapore. He says, Tiger Brokers ad, please. Just joking. Hi. Guys, make sure you check out Tiger Brokers. Not sponsoring today's video, but definitely do check them out. Thank you very much, Pradeep. It seems like you're, you're sponsoring today. Appreciate that, man. And Barnsey says, Australian $2 support the entertainment and great teaching. Pre appreciate that, Barnsey. Good looking shot there, sir. Permit Fisher says, I'm buying the VIX calls. I think the Xmas rally is going to suck. Yes, yeah, so that's another thought process we'll talk about. Let's go through the DXY though. I want to connect these markets together. So first up, we have yields up today, the market's down. Okay, that's the general discussion. We're looking for signs of dollar index strength. Otherwise, if it doesn't start breaking through levels such as this, which is only really a minor level, but if it doesn't do it, then we have to expect it to go down to that 105. If it goes down to 105, that's probably going to synergize around probably just underneath 4,100 with the S&P 500. This current point, obviously, more like 4,000 with the S&P 500, 39.80. That's where it is right now. So again, dollar index, something we have to look at. Let's check out copper. Is copper falling? So copper has been a breakout superstar. It's broken to a level where it's actually synced and I've got an alert. So the alert was, you know, copper breaking out. Now copper going up is a positive sign for the economies moving forward. And I certainly would say if you're a bull, you're looking at this and saying, damn, that's pretty damn good. I'm pretty happy with that. If you're a bull as well, you're looking forward to seeing this particular combo continuing to bull up. So even if the market's going down, and this is something we have to watch now if we see the markets going down. So if markets go down, a bull, a long-term bull, will want to see this ratio continue to go up. That is consumer staples beat out Sorry, consumer discretionary beats out consumer staples. Yes, I want that so bad if we are to turn around. Contrary to popular belief, I'm actually I'm actually not a doomer on the markets. I want the markets to turn around. I don't want us to go into an epic crash here. It's not ideal for, I think, the economies around the world, the type of money flow, and just, of course, humans, humans in general. I know a lot of you will be like, yes, bring on the crash. But at the same time, 
I would prefer that we do find some kind of stability. To find stability, I've usually found the consumer discretionary, XLK, and semiconductors pull us out of recessions. They pull us out of the deep crap. So if we're in a non-trap, we really need to see this rally forward. This is a question we're getting here. Uh, can we be in a trap, says Indian Dude on Michigan Trails? Yeah, we certainly can be. And we don't really know the true damage. We know the other day people were talking about Credit Suisse. All of a sudden, people freaked out. We know the Bank of England intervened in their pension market. We know that China has a severe problem in property and that they're starting to support that. And clearly, there's a big problem there. We also need, know that it, it would seem unfathomable that only a year ago, we could be sitting at a potentially a 5% interest rate and zombie companies wouldn't be dead. So there's got to be something out there that's worse. I mean, FTT, the whole thing going on in crypto, if you're not keeping um, on top of that, that's a disaster. I mean, that's uh, billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars wiped off the table. It's not quite Lehman size, but it's damn big. I mean, in terms of full valuation, what, does anyone have the full valuation of what actually is lost, lost in FTT so far? Put it in the chat if you know. Josh says here, a deeper 20, 30% decline would be a gift to folks to retire in 10 to 20 years. Well, yeah, I mean, it would certainly be a technical gift to keep the market low, lowish here also for a little bit longer. We really do need to, to lower the year the, the the pe valuations in markets to reset a few things to allow the economy to have a nice four five six year run and if that doesn't happen then we're just going to go back into some form of psycho market and then then all of a sudden you know everything's going bad can semis sustain this rally uh, probably not i think semis will will drop back but again we're looking for that consist as an investor you're looking for the consistency across the whole thing. Human 420 says Tom Brady, who invested like 580 million, is left with 90 million. I'm surprised he's left with 90 million. I thought I thought he'd be leaving even less than that. And Richard Jennings says around eight to ten billion customer funds. And Alan says 10 billion liabilities minus one billion in assets left so far, I guess. So yeah. Wall Street would love to buy stocks cheaper and have their cash to bring the stocks lower. Uh, yeah, yeah, but they, they they definitely do. They'd love to buy it cheaper. This is a very tough time. I got to say, it, it's not easy navigating a recovery that is not led by, you know, the, the big stuff. Then all of a sudden we crash. Then we see the inflation number. The inflation number then starts the recovery we want to see because, of course, valuations start to cry, creep up in growth. That's what we've had the last couple of days. It, it does make it tough. So let's jump over to the US 500 and think about some case scenarios here. First up, let's just talk about the big one. I think it's clear that this is my favorite kind of trade of this year. I really enjoyed this one. I mean, obviously, maybe I, I enjoyed it too much, but <laughs> there, was, there was a great short here later uh, earlier on in the year. We certainly were all over this one uh, together. Now, I'm not going to say that I knew what was happening with the inflation number because I didn't. The weeks leading or that couple of weeks around that was pretty good. Uh, the inflation number obviously dropped, massive rally. You know, I wasn't going to fight it. I didn't fight it because I thought, yeah, that's pretty good. And now we're squeezing higher. So if we keep squeezing, I think for bears, there are two scenarios that we have to look at. One, we keep moving higher. We hit something around this 4,100 and we basically clean up the gap that sits underneath here. Remember the market gapped in this news and then fell lower. We squeeze everybody else out. We options expire. All of these third week options we're going to look at in just a moment. Trillions of dollars of options just getting destroyed. And then we have the chance to, of course, move down. And then we get that real decision. So the gap, there's another gap down here, which sits just on that inflation number. So what if we saw this? What are you going to do if this occurs again? Are you going to be a buyer or are you going to be a seller? That might be very tough. You may actually have to look for the signs to be a buyer or as an investor, you might have to just go, you know what, I've seen enough. Maybe you're still seeing XLY, XLP recover. You're seeing the right things that you believe are good. And then you say, okay, that's the, that's the base. So the big trap is going to be most likely around 4,100. But there is another case. Remember, we used the dollar index before. 
for potential weakness over the next couple of sessions. Notice how this market's been going high, low, higher high, and it was actually a lower low. Interesting, weakness actually was found here. The market then rallied, squeezing anyone that was short here with another higher high. We find ourselves basically sitting in the middle of that. If we make a new low, lower low that is, I truly think this market's going to be coming down for a pullback. That's the, the dulling or creep up, at, like slow kind of melt up in markets. It's very important that the market makes a new low underneath this. If it doesn't do so, it's unlikely that we have seen really any bearish action yet that isn't being met by bullish demand. So for, for bears, you're needing a new low this week underneath here. For bulls, you're just basically saying if it comes down here, around that, uh, we'll give you the price, around that 39.50 area, we're wanting to see instantaneous bullish strength. And if that happens again, there's a good chance we push in, we go towards that 4,100 zone, and that's where I think the next fight is. And that would probably be the, the normal case scenario here. For bears, you really need that 39.40 or lower, then maybe a pullback goes short, pulls back, um, we'll have to talk about how far, but you certainly looking first up 3900 and then underneath there there's no structure so you'd have to think quite a deep pullback potentially like a 3760 so depending on how this works if it does stop here and it pulls back it's actually maybe better for bulls because it allows the market to then go up to the 4100 later on potentially if the market goes to 4100 straight away it's probably better for the bears actually because it pushes that rhetoric of everyone getting trapped into a long and then all of a sudden, oh, whoops, you FOMO'd, bad luck. So I like both of those levels quite a lot. Let's see what the chat's saying here. Alberto says buyer, of course, okay. And then 50 billion on FTX. There's a few people coming in with some big, big numbers here. That would be pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, Alan Leong says, so is midterm seasonality completely out the window now? Uh, so the midterm seasonality that you're talking about, it's doing kind of what you would expect. So where are we in the month, the middle? What happens in the middle of November or the 10th, realistically? It turns. So we sit here and then we go down, kind of creep down over time. So if you're talking about bear market years, we've followed that, that general process right now. If you're talking about normal years with midterm seasonality, we generally have a little dip through this, this middling section after kind of recovering normally back of October into November. Well, we didn't do that this year, so we're probably not going to use that year. So if we're thinking about this one, I mean, that's all, that's all that we're saying. It's had a recovery and it's going sideways. To use that by itself is not going to be that strong. Conditional seasonality, this is, this is a time that's different to others. Usually I'd use this a huge amount. Uh, but yeah, that, that's that's what we've got going on in that one. Good question. That's the way we see it. Is it time to go long Chinese tech stocks? They're not for me. Could you do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think about gaps left on the VIX? I don't really do that much work on them, I guess. No worries, Oz. Catch you later. I don't know who that is, but very good. No worries, Vicky. Appreciate appreciate that you uh, like like the channel. All right, let's move through some more things. So US 500, we've got some case scenarios. We've got some levels that we're looking for for bears to be taking control at the moment. I, I kind of feel like bull bearishness in the morning, potentially met by bullishness later on. If we do end up getting a low, of course, then you would have to shift uh, your view on this that that it's starting to tip over. But yeah, the bearishness here throughout the start of this session, I think it could be justified. Big, strong week last week, bit of profit taking potentially now this week ahead of the options expiration, which we'll go through in a minute. And actually, let's just do it now. Let's talk about the options. So let's refresh this. We have the 14th options expiration. Now this is only 594,000 units. Max Payne currently sitting at 390. So that's seven points below where it currently is. Now this is not a day I would use Max Payne. But I think what's interesting here is look at these options starting to appear in the call strikes. 400, 405. So people are starting to buy those. 
They weren't existing last week. They just did not. They were not there at all. Let's go to the 16th. We can see here again, 395 calls, suddenly a bit of units, not a huge amount, but a little bit of units. And then let's go to the big one here, the 18th. So notice all of the puts, just huge amounts of puts, 350s, 360s, so many puts, so many puts closed as well on these strikes. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to see calls appearing for this Friday that are coming through. And this is exactly what the market would have wanted. It was all puts only a week ago. Now, suddenly, there's a whole bunch of calls coming through. And this allows the market to do some jump changing, potentially even drop drop down. And it's not really in any problems in terms of call put ratios until somewhere around 380. So Max Payne's 382, 380 would be a fantastic level for the market to close this week. And that's actually well down on where it currently is. It's doing a fantastic job of, of picking people up. But look at this 400 strike. That's starting to become quite large. So I guess, you know, in terms of options, you're favoring probably the downside here now, at least for 20-ish 20, 20 points because of what the option strike's doing. And if the market does get up to a 4,100 and pushes calls everywhere, you're favoring a back-end week downside. I mean, that's how, how you've got to really look at this. Thank you also the 1,408 viewers uh, coming through today. Appreciate that. Ben Islet, good to, good to meet you many times. Ben, great stream today, Tom. No worries, Ben. Thank you very much. People saying, look at the put call ratio. Uh, yeah, put call ratio will, will show up some things. But we could have a look. I, don't, I actually don't know what it looks like. I put put calls. Should be able to. PCC, yeah. PCC, I think. There's different put call ratios you can do. You can do PCC put call ratio equities uh, plus indices. We'll just do that one. Have a look where it's sitting. Uh, when you put these on your charts, you always want to go line. It just makes it easier. And what you'll notice here is that the puts have come down on this weekly. So let's have a look at the daily. So PCC is 0.759. Now, that's very interesting. That basically usually, remember, we can use this as a counteract. So if we load up SPX, and you always want to do this with your charts, guys, as traders and investors, this is a sweet thing to do. Sometimes it's worthwhile thinking about where is the S&P 500 in comparison to some things. So here we see a spike in puts. The PCC goes outside of one of my boundaries. Now, I have boundaries sitting around here and here usually. I don't know why this one's lower, but anyway, we'll bring that up because it should be about here. So when we have these boundaries, it helps us to say, are we at an extreme zone? Remember the VIX or put calls in general and all these things, they help us to gain an edge on the markets to help us know that if we're triggering one of our trades, does it make sense? Not so much to everything else that's going on in the markets in terms of news and all this rhetoric crap. We don't care about that. Always ask yourself the question, how many bits of news that you read in the newspapers, if you talk about and hear about, how many times has that ever given you edge? And I want to ask the chat this question. I know it's a pretty simple one, but how often does news give you edge in the markets? And that means it gives you pre-ability to be successful in the markets. We're not talking crypto here because I can understand that some news in crypto can help you out. How often does the news give you edge? So here we have a low, the puts are really, really high. Here we have lower calls. We're at an extreme zone that ends up turning around. So in terms of, we have more calls, I mean, less puts. So the PCC can be used as a counterintuitive method. Again, high amounts of puts, 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 see? And this, this is a very decent kind of ratio to use like that. Would I use it completely? No. Would I use it in times like 2022? Yes. But if we're in an upward market, would I always use it? Eh, depends where we are in terms of options expiration. But interesting to see the PCC dropping so much. Um, and a good point. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Brian West says, Jim Cramer is a god. Very good. Galaxy number eight brings up the great one here. News is for selling, rumors for buying. Yeah, well, there you go. That's a, that's a great comment there. You know, one of the ways that trends end up 
finishing is often they sell into things. I'm just going to give you a bit of a hint. If you ever look at a chart, I'll give you a chart, actually. I'll just give you a chart, just randomly. I'll just, just give you a random chart here, and it's a bit of, you know, let's have a question about this chart. This is one of a company that I've liked in quite some time. Now, I'm just going to say this to the, to the chat here. Do you see the problem with this run and what actually ends up happening? So can anyone see when Wall Street or the composite man sell this position? And what this is. So when do they sell this position? What do, what event do they use to sell this position to everybody else? And say, suckers, bad luck. We, you shouldn't have bought that. JBS, uh, JBS says, news around CPI and real estate gives me an edge. So news around CPI and real estate. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, CPI into real estate will give you tons of edge. And a few people are saying it. Yes, gamers got it here. He says earnings. That's correct. Earnings is the one. So, yeah, it's a buy the rumor and a sell the fact. Okay. And that's a classic case of where the news event is used as a liquidity to sell into retail traders, into unsuspecting victims of this particular um, asset at that time. So let's keep going through some base case scenarios on things. We've got the market. We've talked about that one. Let's go over to the NASDAQ because the NASDAQ certainly did see a nice breakout close above most of the key levels. So let's have a look at this on a two-hour chart just to see and understand, is this a breakout? It is from all of what we see here as structure. When the market came down, it obviously left points of supply behind, points of trades that then led on to fairly large sales. So while we're through, and we could be looking at what many people will call a Wyckoff bottom, max pain, selling climax, some form of spring up, potential SOS, this 12,000 is no doubt very key. That's probably going to be 4,100 on the SPY. And where it is right now could seriously see a dip. Now, what alert level would I set for potentially the NASDAQ this week? Well, I think it's worthwhile considering if we get underneath 11,528, what happens at that point? So we'll definitely set an alert there just to see what happens should the market go underneath. If the market goes underneath, I'd be expecting this kind of thing. Maybe we go down, fill here, and then make our next decision. If we keep pushing up, where are we going to have problems? Somewhere around 12,000. It just makes perfect sense that those two levels are probably the most important zones for the NASDAQ, and they should coincide with our, our S&P 500 analysis before. Let's keep going. Let's go to gold. Is gold strong? Um, frankly, yes. I think gold does well. Oh, this is a pretty crazy chart I've got here, but uh, gold does well in both stagflation and lowering interest rate environment, or and both of those seem to be the case scenarios at the moment. We did really talk about gold down here heavily after that weekly close. Is anyone here in gold? Not that uh, it, of your own dis decisions, of course. Anyone here in gold? Let me know in the chat. Let's see what's happening. Dave says gold is bullying up. Yeah, gold looks pretty damn good. And Anton says, I've been a long time net investor. It's a great company. Don't disagree with you. I really hate how their CEO just jumps massive amounts of the stock all the time. Yeah, that's not really consistent with what you'd want. A few people saying they're in gold. A few people saying no. <laughs> Rick, Rick Flair's here in the house. He says, I'm in gold, but I love diamonds. Diamonds are forever. And so is Rick Flair. <laughs> good good to see you there rick flair welcome back welcome back good morning tom says donk and dave good morning donk it's good to have you here so a few people in physical gold few people waiting for physical pullbacks or pullbacks in general in gold no recent buys though fair enough and david says i'm in gold accumulated a few weeks ago yeah well it's it's a very fair assumption that you think that this is fairly strong i mean regardless of what's going on in the dollar it looks like gold's got the right kind of movement in it. It's got a triple wick bottom as it, do, it does well in interest rates going down or, of course, stagflation, which could be what we're going into, at least for a period of time. And we've based and broken through here. So we're looking for pullbacks in gold to potentially be met. We can't really see too much edge here in the current 
market consider uh, market levels. Of course, it's consistent with that dollar index. We're hitting kind of a critical zone. If I was to guess on gold today, and it would be a guess, it'd be towards weakness actually, um, and not strength, just because of the structure of this smaller time frame. Uh, if I go to a 15 minutes, if I make more sense of it, yeah, I think weakness is probably the play here through the session. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I think it's weakness the whole, you know, forever. I just think it's weakness for the session. It's had an amazing run on it. And of course, dollar index, if that strengthens, if we expect the stock market to weaken here a little bit today, uh, all of these things uh, should play out. But gold in particular does look a little bit weak through this session. We'll find out whether it is later on. Uh, US oil, I don't have much commentary on this. I know a lot of you want me to say, what do I think? I don't really know. I mean, if I was guessing down uh, because, oh, I can't even guess down. You know what? I call it neutral. I, I don't really, I don't think the chart helps you very much through this. And we've we've had buying here before. Uh, we we don't necessarily see a turn to the downside yet, although it may look like it. So, yeah, I think with oil, it's a tough one to pick at this stage. Quantum mechanic, $1.99. If gold hates yield, it's predicting a rate pivot. It's predicting consistently. Remember, it likes stagflation, which is consistently high yield, high rates, or it likes cuts. So it's not so much predicting a pivot as it's predicting a new environment. Flattening of the two and 10 year yield curve will confirm stagflation. It's a good point there, Bit Badger. If you ever want to load those on your charts, guys, you go US O2Y versus US 10Y, and you can chuck that on your chart like this, and then you can see here the yield curve. So at the point, at this time, uh, the yield curve has been fairly consistently high on the 210, and it's been flat, flat lining here a little bit. That's a, that's a great point. I don't know if we have, how much history do we have on this code? uh 80s so we don't really have a stagflation period but it's a great great point a bit badger if anyone has the the results on that maybe a, a study on it to do with stagflation and flattening yield curve i'd be interested to have a look it's it's such a good point permit fisher four dollars 99 thank you very much permit fisher always support appreciate your support how does TLT look here? Yeah, good one. Let's have a look at TLT. So this is uh, obviously 20 plus year treasury bonds. They'll benefit if we see lowering rates and they'll flatline sideways kind of thing if we see consistent rates. Remember, they're not trading off what the Fed's actually doing. They're trading off what the market believes is going to be happening over the longer period. And TLT is 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. It didn't quite get down to our alert yet. It's starting to structure up. There's no doubt that this is an interesting point here for investors. It'd be hard to hate TLT here, but you just need to understand that it hasn't hit your technical lows, theoretically. Uh, does it look good? I don't even know if I use technicals that much on this. I just use levels and it would be more of an investment than a trade. Uh, consistently though this is this is a point that we've hit in 2008 2009 2010 2011 and it generally has been very good during market crashes but not market crashes that are caused by increasing interest rates of course that's not the way it works so yeah i, I think it's you know it's it's a matter of percentage points away from the low let's just have a look here so even if it went down you're talking about nine percent if you even went back to where we were in March of this year, that's 42% increase from current price. So yeah, TLT is at, it's a pretty sweet level, but there's still downside risks like anything, but it's it's certainly at a, a level that's pretty good. How's HYG look? HYG just effectively looks like people are starting to buy into risk. You know, bonds are, bonds are doing a little bit better. Remember, this is pure risk on because yields haven't moved in the last two sessions, yet we've had two upticks in, in high yields. So if high yields have another good session, they break a new high, that's uh, that's another good sign for the recovery bulls. We're not seeing it yet. Uh, we have got some nice recovery signs, but not, not enough you know, XLK combos, that kind of thing. 
You mentioned you think pullbacks on semiconductors will happen. I figured you might follow Soxes and Soxel, NVIDIA, ER on Wednesday. That's correct. And AMD was upgraded to 100 today. Yeah, I mean, I still think pullbacks are natural in those kind of things. If you look at something like, let's say, you know, these things like Soxel, I would personally never use Soxel as a barometer. There's a reason. Soxel is a 3x leveraged ETF. Why would you use that in terms of doing your analysis? It's slightly inefficient. So you'd be much better to trade Soxel or use it as your tool, but instead to use semiconductors and other more efficient ETFs to look at your analysis. Two incredible sessions here after, well, actually three incredible sessions from semiconductors. A great turnaround story here. Obviously, gaps left. But yeah, just a, just a word of warning. Don't use 3X leveraged funds to do your to do your analysis. It's just, it, it won't work. It's not a good idea. Are we seeing a recovery in communications yet? Cool sector to be obviously looking at, XLC. Communications certainly starting to see recovery. Here's where they are. Here's where communications got to. It's not not actually out of the out of the uh, the house yet in terms of nastiness, but yeah, it's 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 doing better, and that's that's actually an island reversal, which is exactly what you'd want to have. You can see why this has been aggressive, but we're within a hundred points now of the S and P five hundred finding serious issues. Jeremy Gard says, at Trapperbuck, interesting. I think I agree. Short December contracts, so might have to switch to March 23 shorts. A lot of shorts still sitting, Jeremy, in December as well. In between, though, this November expiry this week and December. So once December's done, the shorts really thin out. Brian says the 15th tomorrow, Treasury is mature. Do Treasury maturity dates have any effect on the markets? Uh, they'll move the markets, but not very much. Most of the time, you, you've never heard of them for a reason, Brian. <laughs> um, a lot of the time, no, nothing happens, yeah. So I wouldn't worry about those things. Now, could there be something there? Yeah, it's statistically less likely, I guess. All right, let's continue through. So we've looked at gold. Obviously, we, we think that's a little bit weak here today. We've got dollar index starting to find some strength. And that certainly has some alerts on it. Should we get through that mi mixture there? We've got markets seeing some weakness in the morning, but you'll be just more guessing that weakness could be coming through to this 39.50 area. If we get down below 39.40, Pullback should be met by at least in like some kind of sell demand on the short range. And that would be consistent to what we've got going on through markets. So maybe a waiting game for those. Let's talk about the elephant in the room though. I want to go through Bitcoin here. Bitcoin has shown quite a lot of weakness. And I think that the, the market's not good at all in crypto. It's not just the FTT thing. It's also crypto winter. It's the degradation across the board on so many pairs. And that we usually have seen between negative 83 and negative 86%. Remember, that's what we've generally seen through these markets. Negative 83 to negative 80 cent, taking us to 11,500 to 9,500. Now, of course, negative 83, negative 86, this could be a negative 90, it could be a negative 81. You know, where are we right now in comparison to the lows? So let's just take to take that out into consideration. Let's grab from the high. Let's bring it down to where we've just had the low. So what have we hit? About 15 point something. So about 78%. So we, we're very close to those statistical lows. Very close. 83 and 86% were the lows. In terms of timing from top to bottom, so let's just take the timing here. From top to the bottom, it looked like we had around 360 days-ish. So where are we right now from that? If we go here, from top to bottom so far, we're at around that right amount of time. So it, you wouldn't think about it yet, but we are actually consistently through quite a lot of um, quite a lot of days, it looks like, through this time. So this is important because if we take all of these days 
and we say, okay, we, we peaked off in November of 21. We've now seen a very consistent timing here. We've gotten close to the percentages. Geez, I tell you what, it, it is starting to play that game of around soon we should be hopefully seeing the low of crypto. And I've often thought it should happen before February of 2023. So there are statistics around here that give you a little bit better. We haven't quite got a bottoming market condition yet. Remember, the way that the market came out last time was it sideways forever. And it just sat there. Just no one cared about it. And suddenly people cared about it. Here, we, we've just started this decline. So if you believe the stock market's going lower, crypto will most likely go lower. Stonewall says, is China starting a short-term bull run? Oh, look, I'm not interested in, in speculating too much on the Chinese market. Here's the C triple Qs, which is just like NASDAQ, but obviously China. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the right type of basing and their policy is supportive to the economy. So theoretically, yes. Is it in the... Is it, is it, is it in a horrible period of time? Uh, yes. Did it hit extreme lows? It hit periods that we could you could have invested in literally 2010 so yeah i mean it's it's low it's damn low damn 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 low do you want to buy that up to you on risk management but you could make a very good case for it i mean based on statistics based on pe valuations but it's a it's a risk and it's, it's up to you i mean i tend to always go with this here's my questioning and i'll ask the chat this who has the best currency in the world, chat? Who has the best currency in the world? And don't be biased. If you live in the best country in the world's but currency, you can say it anyway. But who has the best currency in the world? The most powerful currency in the world. Coins Monster, $2. New sub here. Great work. Do you have a Twitter? Yes, you can follow us over at FX Evolution. So I'll just type that handle in. You can definitely... Follow us on Twitter and we have a Discord as well. Just a quick reminder as well, if you want to enter into the competition, we are running that. And <laughs> someone says Mongolia. Uh, yeah, if you, we are running competition for a free giveaway. That gives away a whole bunch of our courses. Um, there's a little bit of time to go. Now, I did say I would draw it at the end of today's stream. Because I want to make every, everyone a fair chance of getting into it, I'll draw it during the video tomorrow. Okay, so I'll video record it. I'll go in there. I'll bring in everyone's, uh, you know, first name in terms of it. Obviously, we'll contact everyone after that, so you won't see anything. And basically, then um, we'll pop those out. We'll draw it. Bang, bang, bang. We'll do all four of them, and we'll give them away. So if you're interested in doing it, it's a free competition. You can just enter it by filling in that thing. So people are pretty much correctly saying the United States dollar, the USD. That's that's correct. When you're talking about investment, always consider who has the major currency in the world. I'm Australian, yeah? Why would I be sitting here talking about America and how great the American market is? Well, because you have the major. You have the best dollar in the world. The US is the best dollar in the world. Anyone that says it's not doesn't understand yet how the finance system works. In the future, will it be? I don't know. At the moment, it certainly is. So USD, USD, USD. Also ask yourself why you're here. You probably love innovation. Who has the most innovative companies in the world currently? Again, the chat will answer this question. Chat, which one? Who has the most innovative companies in the world across the board? Oil prices in US dollar. Exactly. A lot of things are. So because so many things are in US dollars, and again, I'm Australian, I'm not from the, I'm from the US. But you have to admit this is this is the big thing that that really makes that 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 country so good to invest into because it has realistically the best innovation currently and also the best major currency. And just when you do a bit of critical thinking about that, that's what you want to be doing. Now, try it up, no doubt has some amazing stuff as well, but ultimately you have to make a decision which one do you want? I mean, you could have both. But, but I like to say, which one do I want? Which one do I think is currently the winner? So that, that's pretty important. Brian says, sorry, North Korea. North Korea? What? Mars is the best. <laughs> you guys are trolling. That's okay. 
All right, the markets are coming down a little bit here. We've got eight minutes till the market opens, so not too long. Let's take a look at some stocks. I know you guys love Tesla, so let's have a look at Tesla. A few weeks ago, we rubbished on and I rabbited quite a lot about 180. Copped a little bit of flack for that one, but that's okay. So it hit 180 and obviously the bounce did occur. Now, congrats, I think if you're part of that bounce, it's not too bad, but you can see here, it's already starting to give up a fair bit of those gains. We're sitting at 192.90. So there has been technically better markets than this. This just was one of the cleanest looking charts uh, to show us a level that we thought it would get down to. Obviously, yes, it did go under 180 by 177. It swiped all the stop losses that sat behind here and went, yeah, we're going back up. There is some serious problems here. Clearly, uh, I don't really know, nor am I going to uh, claim I know that much about uh, Tesla in terms of the underlying workings. But what I can tell you about is the charts. And if we get a new low, there's almost nothing supporting it. So effectively, this like 136, 123 zone, which I've got highlighted in here, is the next level. So I've still got an alert sitting underneath this. I set that after the first alert, after you know it kind of told me maybe it's worth a little sneaky, sneaky attack. And if it now comes down again and makes a new low, I think you've got to be seriously concerned about 136. Now, that could be a precursor as well to tell us some things about the rest of the market. So I think this chart tells us more than just meets the eye. If we get a new low, one of the biggest stocks in the tech in the tech market, in the market in the US, is a bit sick. If that sickness is there, it could then lead into a short that then could flow through quite a lot of other stocks. There are also some other worrying signs. Let's have a look at Amazon. Amazon, while it did come into the middle of this zone, which is fantastic, don't get me wrong, pretty cool level, didn't quite come and swipe those lows. It swiped the middle. Could this be a turn? Yeah, it's, it, it could be. Um, it certainly swiped and got an extreme. I like the zone. I'd be interested, but of course, if it does, if Tesla does what we were talking about, you would expect Amazon to come into that 80 zone. Let's now move over to Google Alphabet. So again, Alphabet took the low here, but wouldn't you expect it probably to come into around that 75 area? So again, does it make sense that it bounced here? Well, I mean, maybe it took that area. This was my base case kind of investment zone. So yeah, not too bad. And then the second one was down here. And then, of course, the, the base base one was 50. So these are the three levels that I really like this year. Uh, yeah, I mean, it hit one. Will it now hit the second one? Again, it's moved up. It's at roll reversal at the moment. So a lot of stocks have moved up pretty heavily, and they all find themselves at the previous support that they broke, and then they come back and then potentially drop off on. Similar to Tesla, similar to Amazon, similar to all the rest. Apple is the only one that totally doesn't look like that. Apple just comes down, hits demand and goes, yep, no, I love my stock. This is fantastic. <laughs> Apple just loves itself so much. You guys buy too much of this one. So yeah, I mean, Apple doesn't look like that. And if it did, you'd have to be worried. Microsoft looks very similar, similar to XLF, another stock hitting close to the highs. So we've got Amazon. Microsoft, financials, you know, so many stocks hitting near their peaks as in roll reversals, critical resistances, all these levels. So I think it does play into that short-term uh, bearish style scenario. Marston says, Apple has so many issues in China, 150 looks shaky. Yeah, well, I mean, they've been moving into, of course, production in America and, and India as well, um, all sorts of things. But yeah, I mean, this this price is is not really a critical technical level, though. Kevin says, at Fink at 79, I think Tesla is being reevaluated after Elon moves to buying Twitter, selling a bunch of his Tesla holdings. Well, yeah, that's also a concern that you have a CEO selling billions of units. Obviously, his his focus at the moment is trying to get this Twitter thing off the ground, and and that's taking time away from his other ventures. And of course, the public one of these other ventures is Tesla. So we're about four minutes off the open here. Let's have a look at the best sectors over the last couple of weeks. And we'll check out the US. Let's have a look here at the sectors. I like to know what the sectors have been doing. So on Friday, we'll go top 50 so we get a bit of an idea. On Friday, we had some strong moves through, of course, more of these semiconductors, 
anything that's been bashed basically the most in terms of compression PE. So growth was doing pretty good. If we take five days, you'll see growth was doing incredibly well, um, specifically things like application software and semiconductor equipment. Semiconductor equipment stocks did really well over the last 10 days. Check out the 10 days, 16.71 as well. And that's where we got those automobile manufacturers. Now, I'm not won over by this one here. I think they're going to be struggling. And the market's clearly telling that automobile manufacturers have a problem, and that is it's high ticket price. People are feeling poor up. It's natural demand, destruction, huge yields. Uh, everyone has to pay more in their housing. Everyone has to pay more in interest rates. It's just not conducive with buying cars. Has anyone stopped buying, like stopped or heard of family members saying, you know, I'm not going to buy a car for a couple of years or something like that? Has anyone heard that? Let us know in the chat. You guys are our eyes and ears. Tell us what you're you're thinking. So yeah, a lot of sectors here doing pretty well. Always make sure you follow or you think about the rotation that's occurring in. In the last couple of days, it's been you know semiconductors and semiconductor equipment that's been doing quite well. On Friday, movies and entertainment did better, and that was more consistent than the last you know kind of week. So is movies and entertainment getting money flowing into it? I mean, it's not a sector I particularly care about, but maybe it's one you could look at because movies and entertainment has been moving consistently for the last five days and specifically had a blowout Friday. I mean, it was all about Friday for this one. Everyone wanted this on Friday. I don't know why, nor do I care. Metals, that certainly interested me a lot more. Uh, iron ore in particular has been a massive run on it the last couple of sessions. So think more about sectors when you're coming up with your with your analysis. One minute off the open. We're about to see it, guys. We are coming in a little bit soft here in the market open. So mostly things like NASDAQ, S&P 500, Russell, they're all down. Uh, the Dow is still fairly high. Obviously, the Dow broke through our little trend line only last week. Uh, for this to really weaken, you probably want it underneath these levels here. So Dow very strong. Um, our combos showing us that uh, the new economy is now the one that's leading this charge on the way up since the inflation numbers. So yeah, uh, that's going to be something that we need to watch. Uh, yields both up today, that's going to be negative for markets. Dollar index, the one also to watch here, go down to the two hour. We bought it up at the start. We're looking at the 10155 being broken to kind of show us that maybe yes, stocks do deserve to be going down. Dollar index finding strength. And uh, ding, 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 guys, we are open. Boom. Oh, red. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of red here. Uh, square up. It looks like some hyper stocks up. So some of the hyper stocks being bought. You know, I haven't clicked on this one in a little while. Let's click on TDOC here. TDOC, oh, 24. So TDOC's actually up a lot off its base, 40%. But check out this. Oh, it's it's so sad when you look at this stock. I remember talking about this and then we never talked of it again, I think once it was around somewhere in this 170 area. But yeah, TDOC was supposedly the future and it, it got compressed. But this is the type of thing where if you think long-term, not so much TDOC, but if you think long-term and you believe we are out of this inflation problem, some of these compressed stocks are back to their issue prices and a lot are. A lot of them are. So hyper stocks could once well again become one of the better plays, but you have to make sure that you're getting close to those lows. You've got to be very careful. They are not trades. They are generally investments if you're going to do those types of things. Josh says, TDOC, what trash? Hey, TDOC was once considered. People literally thought this thing was the best. I mean, I, I didn't say it was terrible. But uh, specifically, you know, it reminds me of things like Zoom, uh, Roku, Twilio, all these types of ones. Obviously, they were all huge. And now look at them. And the ones I've liked the most have to be these cybersecurity companies, CrowdStrike, Net. They've got massive PE ratios on them. But uh, yeah, it usually has been Microsoft for me for the last uh, couple of months. So we're seeing a small recovery here in initial pickup. Let's have a look at the small action. Let's go down to the one minute chart. Just have a quick look around. And you can see that it's it's found some little initial buying uh, on the small time frames. It's been very choppy through the session, very slow kind of Monday action. 
nothing, nothing incredible. Uh, we have had some pretty nice swings. Like even if it swung down to this low down here, uh, let's say even here, we'd be sitting at one. This would be down at around 1.56. I think I favor the short side a little bit here through the Monday session, but that's just because I think we had so many bullish days. A lot of people would have been getting squeezed. Heaps of people would have closed their shorts on Friday, taken stops that went through this high here. So maybe it's time for, for a little bit of shorting action. Tesla is getting killed. Yeah, down 2.15%. Again, it's just consistent with, unfortunately, the Twitter takeover and everything else. Is ARK back in the game? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to say it is. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, while ARK could make money, I would, I don't have, I don't like what happened. You know, I don't buy IPOs in the US for a reason. IPOs, especially tech IPOs, tend to go rally dump. Twitter, Facebook, Robinhood, Uber, I don't know, every one of them. Just go look at all of them. You'll see the same things happen. I've always been consistent on this. And then that was purchased by ARK with coin. I don't get it. Sorry, I can't get behind it. I do not get it. Zom up, uh, 150 up after open. Meme meme stocks are up. Uh, alarm bells, yeah, that's a great point. Might put that in tomorrow's video. You are 100% right. Meme stocks has been consistent with the rally. Look at, look at the meme stock synergy. It's a great point. And what a fantastic point to probably end the show here today on. Uh, if we look at meme stocks and the S&P 500 this year, check out these peakings. I mean, is that a coincidence? Maybe I'll make a video about it, but <laughs> um, it is so, so consistent with what you're saying. The, the rallies, the, 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 bull, the bulldozer has come through generally with meme stock revitalization. And I've said this before, so it's not the first time we've ever talked about it, but it's been consistent with these rallies. Big meme stocks coming through on that final leg. And look when it happens. It always happens near the, it doesn't happen usually down the bottom. That's a little bit of a turn. And then it gets extreme in that final leg, in the final leg. Again, the extremeness coming through. So yes, AMC, GME have been a barometer for risk taking coming back on and FOMO coming back on and that being close to those peakings. We've got PCC showing that. We've got the third week options expiration showing that. It's a, it's a great point. Yeah, so thanks very much, Finken79. You bring up the the most important point here, I think. Yeah, people saying uh, Tesla getting killed down 2.48 is not being killed. Uh, that's correct, yeah. <laughs> I think people forget what actually happened this year. Too easily we forget, guys. Too easily we forget. Just remember, the days you saw a 5% up here, but you have had consistently huge sessions down on the spy. I mean, here is from the top to the bottom here is 5.54%. That's the spy, the S&P. I mean, what, what happens to stocks there? 7, 7%, 7 you know, 8% on some stocks, 12%. That's getting killed. Is Neo still a meme stock? I, I still don't really know what they do. Other than they make they make money from supposedly cars, yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for watching the stream. Thank you for supporting the channel as per usual. If you're interested in entering the giveaway, click the link in the pinned message. We'll be doing the live draw during the video, of course, that I put out on my Tuesday, Monday after the close. As per usual, we'll always be doing that. Uh, yeah, we just try to be consistent here on the channel. We try to approach it from more of a methodical standpoint. If that's something you like, make sure to subscribe as well. And remember, it's not about getting involved in FOMO. If you are a trader, you don't care, okay? What you want is high reward for the risk that you have to take. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be involved in 5% hyper moves. It means that you need to be patient and you need to react, don't predict. If you more importantly want to find out about that stuff, you can jump over to fxevolution.com, have a look at some of the courses we do. I'd recommend the Advanced Scalping Masterclass, even though it's day trading and swing trading as well. It's, it's relevant for all of those. Uh, it's very consistent with getting you into very high 
reward style scenarios. But yeah, of course, you have to be a little bit patient. You can't just be like, whoa, I'm going to take a trade everywhere. Well, it's not what it's about. Temperament, and I'll leave you, I always like leaving everyone with one important message. Here's something I'm telling a lot of people that I've been training. It, trading and investing is all about temperament. Think about all the great traders and investors that you have ever seen. Druckenmiller, Buffett, Munger. They're not necessarily the life of the party, are they? But what they do, what they do have in common is they have the temperament in common. Their temperament is based not around FOMO or fear of missing out or any of these things. They literally will wait for the opportunity and then they strike. Now, they tend to strike really hard and obviously go in big because they've made well thought out systems, but they'll change their opinion like this. I've changed it. Well, especially Druckenmiller, and he's my favorite investor of all time slash trader. So just remember temperament, something to think about. Hopefully you have a great week. Thanks so much. We'll see you, of course, in the next one. Bye for now. Also, if those meme stocks keep going up, yeah, we've probably, we've probably got something con to be concerned about. <laughs> Munger is a party animal, says Duncan Dave. Not sure about that one. I would like to get into the draw. Uh, Glenna, all you got to do is click on the link in the uh, in the pinned message and you can you can just fill in the details. It takes like five seconds. If you if you subscribe, of course, that gives you good karma. It's good. Draken Miller just bought DK and G. Is that true, Scott Morgan? Send me, send me that in Discord. <laughs> Scott, you're back. DraftKings, I don't know where it's at. Well, how low is it? I'm not sure. I'm assuming it's like $10 to $15 or something like that. But if you did, you know, that's always a good sign for you, man. All right. Catch everybody. Did I cover Exxon? No. Let's have a quick look at Zom. You know, it, it worries me people are even bringing up Zom now. That makes me think it's about to get cooked in the next couple of weeks. Because Zom is not a stock that most retail traders or most people ever talk about. I'm not hating if you're in it, by the way. Well, well done to you. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being in in uh, energy. Energy does tend to run well in October into November, but there's usually a turnaround coming and it starts back end of November. Um, so yeah, dividends obviously as well. Uh, Zom is just at the highs. I would expect, I wouldn't mind to see a distribution here into a drop, frankly. Very nice run though. Congrats. Catch everyone. Bye for now. AMC halted. Yep. Well, it moved up too much. Yeah. Ciao.